Uh, today we're going to look at the shoulder examination. Uh, and by starting off, uh, you must realize once again that we're not examining only the shoulder, but we're examining the patient as a whole. So you'll start off with your general examination. Uh, and thereafter, especially in your uh, shoulder examination, you would uh, just have a look at the neck. Uh, see that there's not any problems as uh, shoulder pain can uh, also be caused by uh, referred neck pain. So uh, by doing this, we're just going to ask the patient to go through the basic movements. Uh, put your chin on your chest. Okay, and give me some lateral flexion, flexion to the left and to the right. Okay, there's no uh, obvious pain that the patient is having, thank you very much. And then uh, I would just typically go through and just palpate the C-spine uh, and see whether there is any tenderness. Uh, okay, another important test uh, to determine whether the uh, shoulder pain is uh, of a shoulder origin or a cervical spine origin is the so-called Spurling's test. Uh, now the test is performed as follows. You ask the patient to uh, slightly uh, dorsiflex and flex to the side and then with your hands on, on his head you give axial compression. Now in doing that you will uh, entrap a nerve root that uh, can cause uh, referred pain to the shoulder. If there is no pain uh, obviously then uh, the spurning test is negative and you do not have a radiculopathy of the C-spine. If there is none of that then I'm fairly happy that uh, the quick screen of the C-spine was normal and now we can focus our attention on the shoulder joint. Uh, so once again we're going to uh, stick to Apley's uh, basic principles of uh, look, feel, move and thereafter we're going to the neurovascular test. So uh, we're looking at the shoulder uh, we would typically have the patient stand in front of us uh, and we would look from the anterior aspect as well as from the lateral aspect and the posterior aspect. Uh, we typically would look for any uh, swelling, uh, any uh, signs of muscle atrophy uh, as well as any previous surgical scars. And one can also sometimes see uh, any uh, gross deformity. All right. Uh, that's as far as looking uh, is concerned. Uh, now, when palpating, uh, which is the next principle, uh, we would do well to remember that the shoulder joint starts at the uh, sternoclavicular joint and basically ends at the glenohumeral joint. Uh, so, I typically work my way uh, from medial to lateral, uh, starting with the sternoclavicular joint, and then palpating the whole of the clavicle. Uh, you can thereafter uh, go ahead and palpate the deltoid. Uh, you typically feel for the, the muscle mass and any, uh, any lumps, bumps or uh, tenderness. Uh, whilst you're on the anterior side, you'd uh, palpate the axillary muscle, uh, the pectoralis muscle and uh, also palpate in the axilla. You can then go to the lateral aspect and uh, palpate the insertion of his uh, deltoid on the humerus. Thereafter, I ask you just to turn. Uh, thereafter, one would typically go to the uh, posterior aspect and you'd uh, palpate this uh, trapezius muscle, uh, feeling for any uh, spasms as well as uh, as any lumps and uh, bumps. Thereafter, you can palpate the, tip, uh, the uh, spine of the scapula and then uh, the infraspinatus and teres minor, minor muscles, which are uh, situated below the spine. Alright, uh, then lastly, uh, one can, uh, with your finger uh, on the anterior aspect of the humeral head, uh, one can palpate the biceps groove and uh, see whether there's any. Uh, tenderness originating from the long head of biceps. That's as far as uh, palpation is concerned. Uh, next up we're going to have a look at movement. Uh, so typically we'd ask the patient to uh, start off by just uh, flexing his arms and see how high he can go. Okay, And then bring it back to his side again. And then uh, we test extension. Okay, and bring it back to your sides. Abduction all the way to the top, okay, and bring it down again, and then we'd uh, check for external rotation and internal rotation. Uh, now it's important to remember that we check it with the arms at the sides, and then with the arms 90 degrees abducted. Okay. 
show us some external rotation, that's it, and uh, internal rotation, internal rotation at the, with the arms at the side, uh, we usually ask the patient to reach behind his back, and uh, when you look at the back side, how far his uh, hand can go up, and usually that should be uh, between the area of D4 to D8, then we know he's got adequate uh, internal rotation, thank you very much. Uh, and uh, thereafter, you're going to abduct the arms uh, 90 degrees, and then you ask him to give you some external rotation and internal rotation again. Okay, and then uh, particularly important in the shoulder, uh, after going through the various movements, uh, you need to assess your uh, rotator cuff muscles individually. Uh, so you'll do well to remember that uh, when placing your, your hand on the on the uh, humerus, uh, in the front you've got subscapularis, uh, then right up here you've got supraspinatus, uh, then infraspinatus, and at the bottom you've got teres minor. So typically we'd start off uh, by examining uh, subscap. Uh, now there are various tests, I'm just going to show you uh, one or two. Uh, first of all, you have the patient stand facing you, and then bring his arm slightly forward in flexion and in internal rotation. Then you, you ask the patient to uh, press your hand into his belly and this is the so-called uh, belly press test. And with this you test uh, subscap's uh, strength. And you can grade strength uh, from 1 to 5 as you are well aware. Uh, the second test you can perform for uh, subscap is ask the patient to internally rotate his arm behind his back as you just did just now with the movement and then press your hand away from his body and that also tests the strength of uh, subscap. Right, uh, thereafter we're going to assess uh, supraspinatus. Uh, now typically you want the patient uh, to be at an advantage so you forward flex the shoulders about uh, to 90 degrees uh, then give about uh, 30 degrees abduction to have the shoulders work in the uh, in the plane of the uh, scapula, and then you ask the patient to lift his hands towards the roof. And this tests uh, supraspinatus strength. Thereafter, we typically uh, have a look at uh, teres minor and uh, infraspinatus, and uh, you ask the patient to forcefully uh, externally rotate with his arms at his sides. And this uh, usually uh, if you find weakness there, it can be attributed to uh, infraspinatus, uh, although we regard them as a complex together, and they, therefore uh, we will not individualize. With the arm at uh, 90 degrees A reduction, we once again ask them to forcefully externally rotate, and that uh, although it tests uh, infraspinatus as well as teres minor, uh, weakness there will predominantly be due to uh, uh, injury to teres minor. Okay, and then uh, lastly we can just have a look at, at his uh, biceps. Uh, so you ask the patient to uh, do, we have two tests, the first is called a uh, speed test. We have the patient uh, forward flex and bend his, his, forward flex his shoulder and then bend his elbow simultaneously. And then you can look for any uh, lumps or bumps in the biceps which would indicate a, a, a tear of the proximal tendon. Uh, or any bulges there, as well as any tenderness which uh, can be associated with uh, uh, bicipital tendonitis. And then the other test for bicipital tendonitis is called Jurgensen's test. Uh, you ask the patient to uh, forcefully uh, supinate his arm uh, with the elbow flexed at the side. Any pain elicited in the shoulder will be indicative of uh, biceps tendonitis. Alright, and then lastly, it's important to also examine the neurovascular uh, structures, uh, especially important in the shoulder will be the axillary nerve, uh, with the sensory function being in the so-called regiment uh, badge area, which, uh, if I can just show the camera, is more or less in that area. So you just ask the patient whether you can feel there, that's the sensory function and the motor function will be uh, deltoid, and you can palpate deltoid contraction while he abducts his arm. Alright, so in short, that rounds up the shoulder examination. Thank you very much.
Okay, um, afternoon guys. For this session we're going to be focusing on the ALBA examination. And again, as with every orthopedic examination, we're focusing on the three aspects of look, feel and move. Uh, very important is to be examined the entire limb and not just the elbow. Uh, I've asked the patient to take a shirt for us beforehand to make this um, possible. Very important, you ask the patient to stand in front of you uh, with his arms relaxed next to his side and his palms facing forward in the anatomical position. To start our exam, we look at the aspect of look and we move to the front of the patient. When we look at the elbow, um, we start with a simple thing just looking at the skin. Are there any scars that could indicate previous surgery, for example, or trauma? Another thing we look for is swelling, and swelling can indicate either infection, like a septic arthritis, inflammation, for example, a rheumatoid arthritis, or previous injury. Um, also, what you can see on this patient, the elbow is in a normal valgus position. That is called the carrying angle, and it varies from patient to patient. And it's also gender-specific, with ladies having a larger carrying angle than men. Move to the side of the patient. Uh, we're looking at the elbow from the side. You can see, for example, the patient has a fixed flexion deformity. Um, one can assume that the patient maybe has recent trauma. Also, uh, you look at the electron at the back. They can get a swelling, which is called electron on bursitis. And again, you look for um, scars or erythema or obvious skin changes. Then moving to the back of the arm, um, we can look at the skin. You get a condition called psoriasis, where they get skin changes on the elbow. Um, or they can get nodules, which are characteristics of rheumatoid arthritis. Okay, that concludes the look part of the examination. Then we go to feel. And what you do is you focus on the bony prominences of the elbow, which are the natural epicondyle. Any tenderness there could be a sign of previous trauma or fracture, or recent trauma or fracture, uh, or natural epicondylitis, which, uh, which is commonly called tennis elbow. Uh, bony prominence at the back is the olecranon. So just palpating the olecranon, it could be a olecranon fracture or trauma, or bursitis again will cause tenderness. And on the medial side, you get the medial epicondyle, which can also have previous trauma or a fracture or medial epicondylitis, which is golfer's elbow. Then you also just palpate general joint line to see if there's any swelling. A uh, common place to notice swelling, if you look at the side of the elbow and you feel the bony prominence of the lateral epicondyle, just distal to that, and you can assessed by rolling, supinating and pronating the elbow is the radial head and at the top here, or at the bottom here is the lecranon and this forms a triangle and in that triangle is a soft area and if a patient has inflammation or swelling for example from septic arthritis you can palpate it there and that's also the area where we do our aspirations of the joints. Okay, and that's finishing now with the feel part of the examination. Now we do the move part, you divide it into passive and active movements. The active would be what the patient can do, so you ask him to flex you should go to about 100 to 150 degrees of flexion. You ask him to extend. Um, normal is zero degrees. Some patients get hyperextension. They can have ligament laxity, or it's just normal for that patient. And always compare it to the opposite side. And a very important and often missed uh, motion, remember, is pronation and supination. So pronation is about um, 80 degrees, 70 to 80 degrees, and supination is about 85 to 90 degrees. And again, compare to the opposite side. <clears throat> and then some special examinations and stuff I mentioned earlier, patients with lateral epicondylitis or tennis elbow, you flex the elbow and the common extensors insert in the lateral epicondyle and they allow wrist extension. So you ask the patient to make a fist and you ask him to extend his wrist against resistance and that would cause tenderness of that area which is indicative of tennis elbow. On the opposite side, the medial epicondyle, that's where the common flexors insert and that's for flexion of the wrist. Again, you do the same. You ask him to flex the wrist against resistance. Any pain or tenderness there could also be a sign of golfer's elbow. And no exam is complete without examining the joint above and below. And also remember that any pain in the arm can be referred pain from the neck. And that was covered in a previous session. Right, good afternoon. Uh, today we're going to have a look at the examination of the hand and the wrist. So first of all, we're starting off with uh, Apple's principles of look, feel, move once again. And uh, especially in limbs, as in this case, uh, more specifically looking at the hand and the wrist, uh, one needs to uh, look for any deformities, uh, any skin changes, any swelling, or any atrophy of the muscles. And remember, as uh, lots of the uh, extrinsic muscles of the hand, uh, originate in the forearm, it's important to also uh, examine the joint above, which is the elbow joint. There again, you go through the look, feel, move steps, 
and uh, if you have any doubt or any uncertainty, you would compare it to the patient's other hand, uh, hoping that that will be normal and then you have got a standard as to which you can compare your pathology. So by starting off uh, uh, with the inspection of the, the arm, one would start off with the patient's elbows at his sides, having a look at the carry angle, and uh, normally one would uh, expect the carrying angle of about uh, 7 to 10 degrees pelvis, uh, which is usually increased in females. Thereafter, you uh, just take a look at the uh, gross form of the uh, forearm, uh, especially the muscle bulk, uh, and in our patient here, we see there's good muscle bulk, uh, no obvious deformities in the hand and the wrist as well. Thereafter, you continue towards palpation, uh, and in palpating the hand and the wrist, uh, you first of all ask the patient uh, for the point of maximal tenderness, uh, and that's where you start off your palpation. So in the wrist, you can palpate the distal radius, uh, which is more or less saturated over here with the styloid process, uh, sort of in the proximal end of the anatomic snuff box. Uh, just to remind you again, uh, the anatomic snuff box, uh, and I just ask you to extend your, your uh, thumb like this, uh, is that area over there between the two tendons uh, responsible for extension of the thumb as well as uh, a reduction of the thumb. If you have any tenderness or elicit any tenderness uh, during deep palpation in the anatomical snuff box, uh, that would be indicative of a scaphoid fracture. Uh, one can also palpate for a prominent uh, ulna head, uh, which uh, we call the piano key sign. Uh, when palpating the ulna head, uh, it, you sort of get the idea of a piano key moving up and down. And this is indicative of distal radial ulna joint pathology. Uh, thereafter, uh, the carpal bones, it's really hard to palpate individually uh, but then getting to the MP joints, the interphalangeal joints and uh, the proximal interphalangeal joints and the distal interphalangeal joints. Uh, the way in which we palpate it is by taking uh, your thumb and your index finger in an AP direction and then your thumb and the index finger of the other hand uh, in a uh, radio ulna direction and then uh, gently palpating, uh, feeling for any uh, joint effusions or prominences as well as in tenderness. Now that's more or less uh, as far as palpation is concerned. Uh, thereafter we're going to inspect movement. Uh, now once again one must remember that uh, movement at the wrist includes the movement of the whole forearm as the radius and ulna uh, can be seen as one large joint. So uh, your generally your movements will be uh, uh, supination and pronation. Thereafter, you've got extension or dorsiflexion and polar flexion or uh, just normal flexion of the wrist joint. Then we're looking at the fingers uh, and usually these are the intrinsic hand muscles that uh, supply them. Uh, you can inspect the uh, abduction and adduction of your fingers. Uh, as in this case, you would probably try and test that against resistance and you ask the patient to forcefully open his and like that. Then the thumb, uh, it's easiest to examine the thumb uh, with the patient's hand on a flat surface and asking to lift up the thumb. Now that movement uh, is brought about by the uh, abductor pollicis and must not be confused by uh, your extensor pollicis which will be more uh, from a flexed position towards an extended position. Now thereafter uh, one can individually assess the, the fingers for uh, extension. Uh, just ask the patient to extend his fingers uh, like this, and you continue throughout the whole hand. Uh, with flexion of his fingers, uh, it's really important to assess between or to distinguish between uh, flexor digitorum profundus and uh, flexor digitorum superficialis. Uh, when testing for uh, the profundus tendon, uh, one typically uh, will stabilize the patient's finger uh, just proximal to the distal interphalangeal joint and ask the patient to flex his finger. And as you can see here, the patient has got good uh, flexor digitorum profundus function there. Now when assessing the uh, flexor digitorum superficialis, uh, you typically would like to isolate 
uh, the other fingers and then ask him to flex the finger. And as you can see, movement takes place at the proximal interphalangeal joint. And uh, lastly, it's also uh, important to examine the nerves uh, in the arm, uh, apart from the axillary nerve, which we've included in the shoulder examination, uh, you've got three main nerves that you need to examine. Uh, these are the ulnar nerve, the median nerve, and the radial nerve. So uh, when inspecting or assessing these nerves, you always have a sensory component and you have a motor component. So we'll start off by the sensory examination. Uh, the radial nerve uh, basically uh, is a dorsal uh, sensation or uh, a sensory branch uh, which uh, typically supplies the piece of skin uh, dorsally, dorsally of the first uh, web space. Uh, thereafter your median nerve uh, supplies the radial three and a half fingers which includes the thumb, the index, the middle and uh, the radial half of the uh, of his, his, uh, his ring finger. And then lastly your ulnar nerve uh, supplies the part of skin on the uh, ulnar half as well as the of the ring finger as well as the little finger. Then when testing the motor function uh, it's important to remember that the radial nerve is a nerve of extension uh, and it starts off by a triceps extension and you ask the patient to extend his elbow. Okay, now this can be done uh, uh, against resistance and then you can grade it uh, from 0 to 5 with 5 uh, denoting normal power. Thereafter you can examine extension of the wrist and extension of his uh, fingers as we've already done uh, previously with the movement. Uh, thereafter you can examine your median nerve. Now important in your median nerve is to remember that the median nerve supplies a flexor digitorum a flexor pollicis longus and you ask uh, the patient to flex his thumb uh, whilst uh, stabilizing it at the, uh, the proximal phalanx. Uh, can I ask you to flex the thumb? There you go. And he's got a uh, good function over there. And then also uh, the median nerve uh, supplies the uh, flexor digitorum profundus of the index finger and you ask the patient to once again flex while stabilizing the middle phalanx. Uh, an easy way to test for all of this at once, ask the patient uh, to make an okay sign. Alright, uh, thereafter you can uh, test the motor function of his, uh, of his ulnar nerve. Okay, so uh, Froman's sign or Froman's test, uh, when uh, looking at the ulnar nerve, uh, you ask a patient to grasp a piece of paper uh, between his thumb and his index finger uh, with both his hands and ask him to hold onto it tightly whilst you try and pull it out of his hands. Now in a uh, normal ulnar nerve function uh, your, your abductor pollicis uh, will support the paper there with the extended thumb. Now with the uh, uh, ulnar nerve lesion the patients typically perform a trick movement where they uh, are unable to have any abductor pollicis uh, movement so then they will typically use flexor pollicis longus uh, to perform this movement and this will be from inside. Furthermore you can also uh, as we've already assessed with movement assess the ulnar nerve movement by, uh, by assessing the intrinsic muscles of the hand and that will be uh, abduction of the fingers. Alright, and lastly, uh, we're just going to have a look shortly at the uh, reflexes in the forearm. Uh, and these basically are the, uh, or of the upper limb rather, the, the triceps, biceps and uh, brachioradialis. Okay, so first of all, we're going to have a look at the brachioradialis reflex. Uh, brachioradialis muscle, if one remember the anatomy, runs from the lateral uh, humeral uh, epicondyle uh, down towards the starboard process. And by tapping there, uh, one listens to sort of an uh, uh, extension function at the wrist and uh, this is called the brachioradialis reflex. Uh, thereafter you can uh, assess the patient's biceps reflex uh, and this is first of all done by uh, palpating the tendinous part of the biceps muscle and ask the patient to relax. Uh, it's easier when the arms patient is slightly across his body uh, then you palpate it with your thumb and whilst keeping your thumb on the uh, tendon 
you uh, just give it a slight tap, and as you can note, there is slight flexion of the forearm. Then lastly, you can assess the patient's triceps, reflex, and once again, it's always important uh, during reflexes to have the patients relax completely. Uh, otherwise, you will not be able to elicit the reflex. And then by gently tapping on the uh, tricep tendon, uh, just above the elbow, uh, you get an extension reflex there. And uh, that will be more or less it.